what the hell's value? Practice makes progress. If the test keeps coming back to you in life, then you haven't learned the lesson. People are talking about you in rooms that you've not even entered yet. Fail as an acronym starts for the first attempt in learning. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Sound of Sales. In this episode I have a great conversation with Neil Boeng about the things that get thrown at you in life and how to build your career in sales. I hope you love this episode as much as I do. Neil, um, we know each other for... must be a year? Over yeah, a year? Just over a year, yeah. I can't remember how we met actually. I think uh, the way that we met was it was through some introduction on LinkedIn and I think somebody said to kind of pick my brain on something and you wanted to show yeah. me lead camp. Uh, you yeah. gave me the demo and then from there on we were just like, you know, back and forth with ideas, helping each other out. Um, I was trying to find referrals for you through my clients. Uh, and yeah, I kept coming to you for advice, CEO to CEO. So we've built a really good friendship over time, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we've 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 talked about a lot a lot of things, a lot of not only sales related, but um, whew, fresh start. Indeed. When somebody doesn't know you, and well, I'm with your kid, so little Neil sitting next to me, and I tell him, "What does your daddy do for a living?" What does your daddy do for a living? So I have my little kid. Um, I think the easiest way to explain it is I teach people who are new to sales how to get into sales uh, and how to reach out to other people to get them interested in something they're trying to sell. Is that what your kid would say? Is that what my kid would say? <laughs> uh, my kid, Blake, would say daddy is a teacher. I think that's the easiest way that he would put it. Nice. That's cool. So, um, what do you teach? What do I teach? Um, so I teach the art of prospecting. So when I mean prospecting, it's not so much closing deals, but reaching out to companies that have perhaps never heard of a service or a product, uh, trying to connect with different people in that company to pique an interest to then eventually have a sales interaction or a first meeting. So mm -hmm. this could be through different channels such as email, LinkedIn, video prospecting, voice notes. There are a myriad of different ways to connect and contact people. Yeah. Um, but what I also try to put into that is a human mm -hmm. element mm -hmm. and a more customer centric approach. So I'm not really one of those typical salesy people. That's all about product, product, product. Yeah. Uh, I like the art of storytelling and demonstrating value. And I think when I first got into sales, a lot of sales leaders always say, Neil, like, make sure you demonstrate value in your pitch. And I was like, well, what the hell's value? Um, mm -hmm. And a VP of sales, David Dupree, who's kind of my mentor, said to me, the best way to demonstrate value is giving somebody some sort of information or piece of content or, you know, some advice without the need to actually buy from you. And that's valuable. So if you don't have to sign a sales order and I can give you something, that is value. Yeah, true, true, very true. I think it's something that, that a lot of people forget, um, especially if you're new into sales, is uh, this is my product, buy from me. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, and like, I can give you a real life experience of that. So um, in one of my current clients, Happio, I've just onboarded three new SDRs uh, and one of the sales development reps, he's come from the world of sales, but traditional sales, like more manufacturing, mm -hmm. and this is his first tech sales job. And throughout the onboarding, um, he kept asking the question, like, which feature is our killer feature or what's our unique selling point that, you know, can really wow um, a prospect on the other side of the phone because, you know, we're trying to generate business. And what we were saying was, well, with our platform, there could be 3000 features that are really cool, but dependent on the person you're speaking to, maybe only three of them are really, you know, applicable to yeah. them. So the value is, you know, not so much a feature, but it's the whole service and what they're able to achieve as a platform mm -hmm. as a whole. And then towards the end of the week, we kind of said to him, so, you know, like kind of what you were looking for before with that one killer product, what's your thoughts on it now? It's like, yeah, it's not just one thing. It's a whole solution in one. Yeah. And it's what they can achieve through that platform. And I was like, there you go. There's a value. Yeah. I think also the unique selling point is, is you, like the person that is actually 
selling it. If they have a shitty feeling about you, then you're not going to sell. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And do you know what, like, Bram, this is, I don't know, it's a contentious subject on LinkedIn because I've seen a lot of people, like, talk about this where they say people buy from people and I believe in that. Um, whereas I've seen other people say people buy from people, that's not the reality because, again, if a vendor offers the same thing as another vendor, it's just dependent on which one has the better price point. But what you find is 57% of customer loyalty or returning customers is based on the sales experience alone. Yeah. So kind of like what I say to SDRs, like you're that first face, you're that first conversation. And based on that interaction alone, that will determine how the sales cycle will go. So if you have a really bad sales experience, like a, I don't know, a car salesman, this happened to me years ago when I bought my first car, walked into a dealership, I had cash from my father to buy my first car, brand new. And I walked into the dealership and I waited around 15 minutes waiting for a rep to come up to me and, you know, start talking to me. I had to go to the desk of the rep and say, hey, I'm looking to buy a car today. And he turned around to me and he said, oh, you're seriously looking to buy. I just thought you were just walking around. And I was like, no. So I walked out of that dealership, went to another one down the road. As soon as I walked in, they greeted me. They said, hi, if there's anything we can do to help you, please let us know. Here's like a free mm -hmm. cappuccino. Uh, they walked me around the showroom and I purchased the car from them on that day and there. And obviously when I went to go get my second car, I went back to the same dealership. So, yeah. you know, it is people buy from people from my point of view. Yeah, indeed. There's a, there's an example of that as well, that on the, the Belgian auto fair, so there's every year, there's like a yeah, fair or whatever. Um, and there was a person and he was not neatly dressed and that sort of stuff. And he entered the boot of Ferrari mm. and they didn't look at him. They thought like, Oof, not going to deal with this person. Let him look around. He went to the other side and bought a Lamborghini. <laughs> 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 yeah and, and and i believe that because um what is it uh, with i think a lot of millionaires billionaires and etc they always say that rich people don't dress rich if yeah. anything they'll probably wear the same t-shirt uh, over again or the same turtleneck like steve jobs over and over again it's the people mm. that maybe are not rich and again nothing against that that will try to look rich you know yeah, yeah. um but i had that same experience uh, in my working life way before sales i used to work for dhl the logistics company yeah uh, and i used to work in the warehouse and i'd been there for quite some time and obviously working in a warehouse i was a supervisor so i had a team um and working in a warehouse it's really dirty it's grimy you get covered in like dust from boxes and everything like that and then one day, uh, a new subcontractor walked into uh, the warehouse. And obviously, I came to greet him. And I'm wearing a T-shirt, a high-vis, you know, my DHL badge. Uh, and then he came to me and said, excuse me, mate, uh, can you tell me where the boss is, please, around here? Um, and he says, yeah, and, and also, like, let him know that one of his new contractors are here, mate. And he spoke to me in a very condescending tone. And I turned around to him, and I was just like, I'm the supervisor. He was like, oh. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. But it kind of made me think, I was like, maybe what I'm wearing is, you know, what I'm portraying out there. So like the following week later, I've made sure that I put on my tie, I had my white shirt, I had my viz and I had my badge. And yeah, people that walked through the warehouse treated me slightly different. So yeah, first impressions count 100% agree. Yeah. Yeah, to, to some degree, you can you can go with that, I think. Um you can go overboard as well and just like fake it till you make it type of first. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but indeed, yeah, I, I remember when um, I think everybody knows uh, the series on Netflix, Suits. Um, you watch it as as a starting entrepreneur. And you think like, oh, I'm going to dress up with my power suit on. You feel a different person as well. It, it does something to your business when you, when you are in that mindset. Yeah. It's just... You have to you have to find a way to get into that mindset without all the bells and whistles, right? Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that's something um, I kind of practiced in lockdown. So where we had that element of you know having to work from home, hours on end, we're in the same room day to day. It was very difficult for me because literally next door in my home office is my bedroom. So I'd literally wake up, brush my teeth, and then come into this room. Um, and at first it was really exciting. I was like, okay, I don't need to commute anymore. I don't have to like, you know, dress up and et cetera. And I could just sit here yeah. in my t-shirt and sweatpants. 
Um, but I did notice that my motivation started lacking as the weeks ensued because, you know, I just didn't feel like I had to make an effort per se. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously I do like online training and I'm training reps remotely. Um, I always like wear a shirt or I always wear a polo shirt. And then I always noticed that when I was doing a training session versus, you know, just managing a team on one to ones, there was a difference in the way that I approached and the way I presented myself and the way that I was motivated. Uh, and then one day I connected one one on the team and I thought, you know what, I'm going to give an F and I'm going to brush my hair. I'm going to put on my polos that I normally wear when I'm training. I'm going to have a shave. And as soon as I connected with one of my reps, they're like, whoa, Neil, you look different. And like you look, and that made me feel better about myself, you know, and then that translated in the way that I was interacting with people. So similarly, like with this podcast, again, Fridays are my normally my day off. I'm in my t-shirt and sweatpants, but yeah, I thought I'd make a little bit of effort and try it out. And I feel different. And, you know, you want to make yourself feel good. And I think that's important for a lot of reps um, when they're on the phone. So like uh, I always believe in smiling and dialing. So I have somebody's LinkedIn profile up. I look at their picture and then I close my eyes. And I say, hey, hey, Bram, it's Neil calling from such and such. And I make sure that I sit up rather than slouching down so that I feel good, you know? Yeah, um, good. And another one, like one of my reps said to me this morning, because we were doing cold calling training, he's like, Neil, when I'm doing cold calling, should I be sitting down or can I walk around and talk and walk? And I said, to be honest, by walking up and around, you'll actually, you know, have a better conversation with the people because you're more open up, you're feeling more chest and you're feeling more confident. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, like, again, it's not... a that I think you have to dress up or you have to be a certain way. But I have found for mindset that dressing up and showing up um, really definitely helps with the conversations that you're going to have with people. Yeah. Yeah. I can. Um, it, and then one of the previous episodes we had, we had Michael in Blay um, and uh, he was standing up while doing the conversation. Mm. And after the conversation went live, he texted me and was like, damn, I was aggressive <laughs> standing <laughs> up and, and like I was taking this mic in and I was <laughs> so you have to be aware of what's standing up and, and what what it does to you, I think. Yeah. Um, but I can definitely relate with, yeah, if, if you if you dress up for doing cold calling, like some people would say nobody sees me, I don't care. Mm. Um, but of course you take an approach you actually it's part of your game at that moment yeah that's super uh, i think i think some people listening i can already think of a few that might think like hmm, clever <laughs> indeed indeed and you know it's kind of like um athletes right where uh i've like watched documentaries like when they need to get into the zone so mm -hmm. you know like imagine if you're going to the gym for those that do and you put on your gym gear and that's kind of when you initiate yourself in the morning or in the evening to say, right, I'm going to ready to work out. And then already in your mind, you may be visualizing lifting those weights or, you know, pushing that personal best that you want to have. Um, like I go to a hit class three times a week and it freaking kills me. Like I'm so sore. I'm sweating for like 45 minutes straight nonstop. And before I go, I'm always like, Ugh, I, I can't be bothered to go. I've had a hard day at work. But then I start putting on my gym kit and I imagine like the feeling that I'm going to get when I finish and how pumped and I'm looking forward to dinner. Similarly to cold calling, you know, it's that visualization of getting your game set ready. And I think people like Michael Jordan or great athletes of the world, they visualize themselves winning games or ending the right end of the race and crossing the finish line. And um, again, it's, it's all down to mindset, you know, like a positive yeah. mentality is what creates positive results in reality, Bram. Yeah. I um a few I think last year and then a couple months uh, I went to a coach who did the only thing was mindset um, at the end very spiritually but um, but indeed she told me the same story like you have to visualize it's it's something else with dreaming you have people that dream that they do it and, and that they're gonna make it but you have visualization which is a whole different level. When you visualize, do you have um, do you have a, a structure of getting in that flow, in that mood, or does it come natural to you? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, literally as we speak in front of me, I have a vision board. Um, so to kind of give a bit of context, uh, four years ago, my life kind of fell apart with a lot of things, weren't working out, uh, lost my home, 
my car, everything. And I was living at my, my mother's uh, living room floor for around six weeks. And the only thing I had, the only asset I had was my laptop. Uh, and I kind of sat there for six weeks, very depressed, you know, contemplating what the hell am I going to do with my life that I literally opened up Microsoft Word and I kind of wrote a few bullet points of like what I wanted to achieve. And I said, I want to get a new home. I want to have a healthy lifestyle. I want to give up certain things. I want to be able to see my son. Uh, and, you know, I want to launch a sales training company. Uh, and slowly but surely, I started doing these things, but just writing it down wasn't enough for me. I needed to have some sort of motivation. So when I moved into this apartment, uh, I bought a cork board, which I call my vision board, and I placed images of things I wanted. So uh, funny enough, one of them was I wanted to have a podcast. I just had a picture of a mic with my face on the microphone, and I didn't know what the podcast was going to be called. Uh, I had a picture of, you know, wanting to launch my own business and I have a check for $2 million written on there and it's just pinned to my vision board because I'm not saying that's the end goal, but I want to one day be able to pay that to myself, you know, have uh, had a bit of an easy life. Yeah. Um, I also like uh, put things about my son of things that I want to enjoy with him and in certain experiences uh, and also, you know, be able to travel again. Like during COVID, I just put like, I want to go to certain countries um, mm -hmm. so for me, like whenever I'm having a meeting or I'm training a team and that shit gets tough, or, you know, I'm having a really hard day, I kind of take a pause and I reflect and I look at this board and that kind of reminds me of why the hell am I doing all of this, you know, and that power of visualization is one thing, but it's also the intent belief that it's already in existence. So I'm yeah, a firm believer in the laws of attraction. So for instance, like I want to be a great SDR trainer. So I always say to myself, I am the best SDR trainer. I might not be in comparison to others, but in my own heart, I am. And I want to be, you know, a great father. And I always say to myself, mm -hmm. you are a great dad, Neil. But I also um, have a diary that I use. It's called the six minute diary, uh, where I write three things that I'm grateful for in the morning. It gives me a piece of wisdom. And at the end of day before bed, I have three things that I've accomplished today, right? And what I always write in it, it says to me, like, what is your daily affirmation? And I always write, I am becoming the best version of me. Because I don't think anybody's perfect. And I think uh, it's Les Brown. He kind of said in the past, you know, what does practice make? And he's speaking to an audience and they all say perfect. And he said, wrong. Get that mentality out of your head. Practice mm -hmm. makes progress. And for me, I want to be improving it by at least 1% every day to be reaching my goals. Uh, and I was speaking to somebody the other week where they said, um, you know, through frustration comes success. A lot of founders, uh, a lot of billionaires, etc., like they want to reach the top of the mountain. They want to like have a million dollars or something like that. But what tends to happen is when they get to the top of the mountain, some people just jump off the mountain. Some people actually kill themselves. There's this story about this guy called Ted where his father was like an entrepreneur and he finally made his billion. And as soon as he got to that billion, he committed suicide. There was nothing else for him to like go after there. Yeah. But the reality is, is the, the mountain has no top. You know, you just want to keep moving and you just want to keep climbing because once you get to the top, then what, you know? So for me, mm -hmm. I'm becoming the best version of myself. I visualize the things that I want. I already believe that I have those things and I have an abundance of everything, be it money, food, love, family, um, when in reality, sometimes I don't already have those things, but I know they will come into fruition mm -hmm. as long as I visualize it. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's, uh, yeah, it makes me silent when saying that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes me think of something that I had uh, back when I still lived at my mom's. I also had uh, the same board and I had, uh, I still remember, I had a Rolls Royce on there and I had... Um, Sunset Boulevard and I had some couple of things pinned to my wall uh, and then my mom always said why, why do you have that I was like yeah but it, it had a lot of quotes on it as well like mm. things to believe in uh, I still have it but it's it's not physically on the wall anymore but um, yeah when you say that it hits in like 
you've been to places you're not building your life you, you took control of it like it's insane like congrats to where you are right now i, I would consider you famous in belgium in the sales landscape <laughs> <laughs> everybody i talk to knows neil Buyang. <laughs> that's that's a fact <laughs> thank you that that's really humbling um to hear and you know like with the whole like yeah we we all go through struggles and i've had my fair share of shit and you know like we've connected as friends and we've helped each other out in certain times and i'm really appreciative of that and i think like one thing that i like meditation is something that i really mm -hmm. like doing and it's it started when i was in that place at my parents place um and it's a whole thing that i learned that life is in a constant state of impermanence or a constant state of flux yeah. things are constantly changing i used to be somebody that was very rigid and i always i love routine and i love things repeating and i know i like knowing where i stand and you know i kind of stay within my comfort zone um and i think you know there's a lot of times when you go through shit in life and the ultimate question that you ask yourself primarily is why you know like why is this happening to me why mm -hmm. did all this shit happen and why like always me 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 but what I kind of learned through meditation was, you know, why is not really the question you want to ask yourself. It's what are you going to do about it? You know, yeah, because it already happened. Yeah. And, you know, and and the thing is, I, I've kind of learned also that these things that happen in your life, like I have a spiritual belief within God. Um, and I kind of think like he puts these tests on me because he's leveling me up for the next thing that's coming in my life. So you may have like a really good time. Everything's really going good. You're like, yeah, you're on top of the world. And then boom, you come crashing down mm -hmm. because there's a lesson to be learned in that. And I don't get as afraid, as scared as when things do crash now. Cause I'm like, right, what is this trying to teach me? Um, and you know, like, how can I overcome this? And eventually I will. And you know, I've gone through a lot of stuff in life. Um, and there's that call saying that, you know, you go to school, to take the lessons to then take the test. But in life, you're given tests to then learn mm. the lesson. But if the test keeps coming back to you in life, then you haven't learned the lesson. And I've gone <laughs> through that multiple times, you know, like dealing with certain people or, you know, conflict resolution with certain situations, be it in work or personal life. Um, and taking time to reflect, to kind of ask yourself, okay, what is it that's really actually bugging me? Is it a person or the situation? Or do you know what, like if I, you know, if somebody pisses me off for the day, is it them that's pissed me off or have I recognized a similar trait in them that is in myself that I don't like and that's why it's making me feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So exploring these sort of things, um, you know, takes you out of your comfort zone and that's something I really strive to do and it's not easy, you know. Um, but it's when you push yourself out of your comfort zone and you try things that, you know, you may have never tried before, that's where you really start to grow as yeah, an individual. True. Um, and like, for example, like I'm training people like uh, around the Netherlands and Belgium and across Europe, and I'm always meeting people that have never met me for the first time. They're, you know, they spect the, they have skepticism about, is this guy really going to be able to help me do what I need to do? Uh, and I always have that fear, like that imposter syndrome. And I'm like, do you know what? I'm just going to give it a go, see what happens. And nine times out of 10, it all works out fine. Um, but we constantly doubt ourselves, you know, like our abilities and our strengths. Um, <laughs> and to your point about the whole thing in Belgium, people talking about me, like one thing that really boosted my confidence last year where, you know, I didn't know what was happening with happy selling. I was trying to relaunch the business. Cash flow was really hard. Um, my mentor, David said to me, he said, Neil, I was in a board meeting, uh, this week with a big company. Uh, I can't mention their name, but, um, the CEOs, they'd never met you before, but they were talking about you and happy selling. And he said to me, sometimes you need to realize, Neil, people are talking about you in rooms that you've not even entered yet. And that's kind of the impact that you can have. And I think a lot of time in sales, we, we have this thing where, you know, we forget, no, we remember everything we forget. And what I mean by that, Bram, yeah. is, oh, shit, I forgot to send out that email. I forgot to send that follow-up. I forgot to, you know, pick up the laundry. We always remember the things we forget, mm -hmm. but we never remember the things that we've achieved or how far we've come. You know, like there's a point A and point B, but it's that journey in between. And this is something I harp on about is, 
you really have to be present in the now. And for a lot of people out there, if you're like new to sales or you're veterans, just think about like, you know, you may have like switched uh, a different organization to come into tech sales. Or, you know, if you're a podcast guest, you may never have done this before, but you took that initiative to jump on and do it. And if you do something every day that scares the hell out of you, that's living, you know, that's when you feel alive. Um, and yeah, I just try my best to like live each day and just be in the moment, man. And, you know, everybody's human and we're all scared. But uh, another thing I learned on my podcast was for every problem that you have, uh, somebody's already solved it. So you can always go find somebody that's going through what you're going through. Yeah, indeed. You gave me goosebumps with saying that you don't know who's talking about you in rooms you haven't entered. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to interrupt you of mentioning that. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Um, I can't go over in my mind that this is a conversation that people will love. Um, because it's very it's very human. It's the sound behind what's what's happening, I think. Um mm -hmm. Um, what I what I like about the current situation in, in the world, I feel people feel more confident to talk about how they feel, and and when they enter sales, for example, they're they dare to say, "I don't know this" or "This I haven't done this before." How do you motivate people? If you sometimes you can feel it that people are like. They, they don't dare to tell what's up. How do you how do you motivate people when being a trainer and being an SDR manager in, in opening up? It's, that's, a, that's a really good question. And it's something that's taken me a hell of a lot of time to figure out for myself. But um, again, something I learned from my mentor, which is uh, vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. And I think anytime I have a new hire or I'm doing a training, I'm saying like vulnerability is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength yeah. to ask for help is something really hard to do, but by doing it, it demonstrates that you're vulnerable, but you're willing to learn and you're looking to ask for help. So I always say to my reps and I said it to like Kirill, like Farida and Tom this week is there is no such thing as a stupid question. It's stupid if you don't ask it. Because if you just yeah. sit there idling, thinking, oh, I don't want to look like an idiot in front of anybody, then you're probably not going to be able to learn and you're not going to be able to improve. But by asking the question to me as your manager or as to your coach shows that you have an interest in that topic and that you're eager to learn and want more. Um, but also showing signs of vulnerability from myself. So, you know, like I'll be doing like one to ones with my team. Or I'll be doing like an SDR sync on a Monday. And I'll always be honest with the team and say, do you know what? I don't know the answer to this, but I'm going to go find out. Or I may say like, look, I'm not the best SDR manager. I never think that I'm the best SDR manager. And there's probably better managers out there from me. So I'm going to go learn and I'm going to go find out. And what I found is by having this approach with my reps or, you know, my students, they, the, they then feel comfortable to open up about it. Uh, and also, uh, when a rep makes a mistake or, you know, they've done something wrong in their CRM or they've not logged something properly, I'll have a rep and they'll come and say to me like, oh, Neil, I feel really guilty. I've kind of done this and I've done this wrong. And the first thing I say is, thank you for sharing. There's not, you've done nothing wrong. You know, Indeed. like uh, I said, I've made this mistake. I've effed up a lot of times. And uh, what I will say to the rep is, well, look, okay, so we know what the problem is. There is a solution. This is how we're going to do it. And then I just ask them, how do you feel now? They're like, oh, yeah, so I feel so great. And by having those sort of moments with your team, that kind of, a, you know, that builds a trust and rapport between yourselves so that they can be open and they can come to you. Um, and kind of a question that I get asked by a lot of students is like, Neil, how the hell do you know so much? And I say, because I've effed up more times than anybody that you know that I've learned a hell of a lot. And that's why I know this stuff. So I kind of say to my reps, it's like through failures, that's where you come success. You know, like startup founders try and launch businesses. Uh, it doesn't work out. It fails. They then go launch another business. That may fail. You may go through 12 businesses, which actually generate no revenue whatsoever. And then it's that one that comes out of it that then blows up and then becomes successful. Yeah. Um, and it's because they've learned. So like telling my reps that it's okay to fail, you know, and fail as an acronym starts with the first attempt in learning. Right. So yeah, that's kind of like how I get people that's to, to nice be okay one. with it. <laughs> first attempt in learning. 
yeah. we're gonna put this on the cover of this episode <laughs> <laughs> that's super nice like you you you've seen the wide spectrum right you've done a lot of things um constantly keep pushing keeps growing um what drives neil oh <clears throat> That is a really good question, and it's really hard for me to answer because I have a few different drivers. But I think, yeah, I, if I could sum it up, and this may sound a little bit morbid, uh, Bram, but it's cool. death. Death is my biggest motivator in life. Uh, and not, not so much in a bad way. It's just knowing that we have a very limited time on this yeah. earth, and we will all eventually die. Um, and as part of my, my social life, I'm what they call a Freemason. So I'm part of like a brotherhood where we practice philanthropy and we learn a lot about life. And within that teaching, it's not religious in any sense. Uh, but we have an understanding that we have a life to live. We must be an upstanding citizen and like mortality is an element of our life and not to fear it. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I look at my son, when I look at my niece, when I look at my family and friends, I know that this time is very limited. When I look at work, I know that tomorrow is never promised. I've experienced death from a very young age. Um, I've had friends and family that I've lost. Uh, and I always say to them, like, damn, man, like that could have been me. Or I may not wake up with, like, do you know, the most biggest privilege, like when I wake up in the morning is the first three things I say is thank you for allowing me to wake up another day. Thank you for letting me have a roof over my head. Thank you for giving me warmth in this house and having enough money to pay my utility bills, you know? So I think I'm given a chance every day. So I need to make damn good use of that day. And there are 24 hours in the day. And I'm a sort of person that may be working, I don't know, between eight to 14 hours a day, depending on what I'm doing. But I just want to enjoy it. You know, I want to be happy that I've accomplished something. And for anybody that's listening, we don't have to be moving mountains here, but, you know, just getting up you know, maybe just going to the gym or having those three square meals a day or reaching out to a friend to check in if they're okay. That's an accomplishment in itself. Um, because again, tomorrow's not promised, you know, I uh, touch wood, it doesn't happen, but I could be dead tomorrow. So I would say death uh, and mortality is my biggest motivator in life. I hope you're not dead tomorrow because I will be the last one having you on the podcast. Yeah, no, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> that will be a very special podcast. <laughs> um, I have to let this sink in because this is this is a different type of conversation that uh, it's super nice. I, I hope people listening have something like, damn, yeah. It's not all about the hustle, right? Indeed, indeed. And, um, you know, like, I've seen lots of different people like define like what their hustle is. Um, there's this great guy on LinkedIn that I follow that he talks about like hustle healthy. So he'll take like sayings from like top billionaires or people that are really hustled like the, the worlds of Gary V. And then he yeah. tries to bring in like a, a positive mindset. So he'll then have quotes with uh, Mahatma Gandhi or perhaps like Buddha. And they kind of like contradict each other's statements, but it's to try and find that equal balance. And for me, um, hustling is something <laughs> I've always done. It's just, I think I define hustle as just like constantly doing something that really makes you happy and has that burning fire and desire in you. Um, and at some point, like in terms of mental health, like I've had a therapist in the past where the only reason I was having that therapist is because I was having millions of thoughts in my head and I was finding it really hard to rationalize and put this down. And I just needed somewhere to kind of offload this. So I did this like uh, every two weeks uh, on a Friday on my day off. Uh, and sometimes I used to say to Diane, just like, right, I'm, I'm doing a sales training project. I'm doing an SDR manager project. I'm doing a podcast. Uh, I'm picking up my son. Uh, I'm doing fitness. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. She's like, woo, you need to slow down. And I kind of said to her, I was like, I don't know how to slow down because I've always kind of been this way. You know, um, like from a young age, I think in my early like 20s, uh, I was working like a government job uh, and then I was working on the evening doing music gigs and I literally used to go full out working like seven days a week and I'd do that for like a month and then one day I'd have a sleep of 14 hours and I did that for like six years, you know, um, and then even included in that I had an evening part-time job being like a pizza delivery guy. I was just, I just always wanted to keep moving and doing something. 
And then I fast forward a couple of years later, I'm, I'm doing happy selling, I'm doing a podcast, I'm doing an SDR manager job, I'm looking after my son, I'm traveling to the Netherlands, I'm doing this shit. And a lot of my friends are just like, how the hell do you do it? And my honest answer to them is, I don't know, I just do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there have been elements where I've burnt out because of this. And it's not so much the burnt, out. yeah, you, you really, really do. And I'm really bad for like taking vacations and holidays. I don't really take a vacation. For me, traveling out to, I don't know, Amsterdam to go meet a team, traveling on an EasyJet flight, traveling to Schiphol and then going on like the tram. That for me is like a mini little adventure. And it's a break from my normal life that I have here in my hometown. Or if I went out to California to go meet a US tech company or something like that that's like a vacation for me. I'm traveling, I'm doing something. But I think with meditation and like being mindful and writing things down and seeing what you've accomplished, it helps you take stock of how busy you are. And sometimes uh, I may have in a calendar where, you know, I may have an important meeting, but I'll cancel it because I know that I've just done too much in the day. Yeah. And like, for example, today, later on, I'm going to go pick up my son. I'm going to have a great weekend with him. Um, and there's certain meetings I've said no to. And I think people need to realize that they, you, know, you can say yes to things, but you also have the power to say no. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't always have to justify yourself. So, for example, with a meeting that I canceled, I just said, look, um, I have a lot on. I really want to have this discussion, but for my own health, I can't do today. Can we please do it at another time? And, you know, most people will understand that. Um, and at the end of the day, if it's really pressing and urgent, like I always say, like family first, uh, then it's your health and then work comes uh, yeah. beneath that so yeah. yeah how do i do this i don't know i just keep going but it's that's the hustle it's just for me it's just being alive and just doing the shit that you want dude <laughs> yeah yeah but you there's a, a little distinction because you know when you're burning the candles on both ends yeah you feel it and you say i'm, I'm not gonna do this meeting yeah because i don't need to give you a reason basically um do you see that new people in sales, juniors, or that want to that want to ramp up their career, that um, that that's almost a pitfall of not having the feeling? Yeah, uh, I, I've seen it like time and time again with a lot of new reps. Uh, when they first start on, they're uh, taking in a lot of new information. They're trying to absorb this. They're then trying to apply it. To, to whatever they're doing with their prospecting or speaking to prospects. They're learning new technology. They then have this stress of like having a target over their head. Um, they're trying to ramp up as quick as they can. They want to like have more responsibilities. They want to do this. Um, and even like with my new hires this week, they're asking for a lot. And the thing that I kind of said to them is like, look, we're right now we're in Q4. Uh, the, the company is busy as it is. Uh, and this sort of quiet time that you have, you're never going to get it back, right? Mm -hmm. Because in about three months time, you're going to be fully proficient. You're going to be like going on, you won't have time to take a break. So my advice to them is like literally take everything step by step, like mm -hmm. take a break, reflect on what you've learned, ask yourself, what is this call? Go for a walk, go take a coffee. Um, and then equally like with new SDRs that have been ramped, the next thing that comes a challenge for them is time management. So like I'm having one-to-ones and they're like, oh, I'm struggling to keep up with my leads. I'm not sure how to follow up with this person. I don't know when I should be doing my calling. Um, I don't know when I should be syncing with my account executive. So I sit down with them uh, and I look at their calendar and I say, well, look, realistically, you have like eight hours in a day, right? And this is something I learned from Morgan Ingram, um, like another SDR trainer, mm -hmm. where Morgan says that you need to kind of see this as eight magic blocks, to your day, right? It's not just a full day of working. So one block could be for calling, one could be for personalizing emails, one could be to go take a coffee break or go to the gym. Another one could be syncing down with your AE. And I get, kind of give a template to my reps and say, this is how I used to work as an SDR. I want you to create your own magic blocks just as a draft, right? Uh, and it doesn't have to be the same or as detailed as mine. And what I want you to do is run for the next two weeks on this new draft of blocks for times to do specific things. And then we catch up and then I ask them, like, how's things going? They said, you know what, I'm feeling less stressed. I know what I should be doing at what time, but I actually think I could do calls at this time. Or I think it's better to do research in the afternoon when, you know, I'm plugging in my headphones. And then over time, I'm just like, you own your own calendar. Like you, you define like how your day is going to be and you are the CEO of your own territory and time. 
but like being proficient with your time management is kind of what will remove that stress and feeling lost. Um, and similarly with myself, like I have a calendar for like work, but also I include into my calendar when to switch off, when to wind down and like reminded to myself when to meditate. And also I put water breaks in there. Like our bodies are 80% water and we're sitting in front of a screen for hours and on a day. You need to hydrate yourself and like, again, you're only human, you're not a machine. So yeah, I've seen it a lot. But, you know, loving yourself first is key. Um, and you can set yourself up for success by just, you know, uh, setting the right schedules and being consistent with routines. Routines yeah. is what builds habits to success, I think. And I think that was Brian Tracy that kind of like drilled that into my head. That's an interesting one. I think, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've recently bought um, a daily planner thing. It's a, just a, a piece of paper basically yeah <laughs> it's like moving away from the screen to even keep your to-do list bringing it back turn off all your devices and just sit and think what am i going to do today that's going to take the, take up the needle just one percent mm-hmm. um and it, from the moment that you realize that it's like yeah when when it when it was a hard time in COVID with the business um i don't have to tell you we talked about it a couple of weeks ago yeah. um then I sat with friends and I literally said, like, if you're okay that it can all go down, your game time begins. If you're, if you're okay to, like, if you let go of all the materialistic things, so to say, yeah. uh, that, that's when, when, things, when things happen. A hundred percent. I think uh, in a former life, I was a very materialistic person uh, and up until the point where I lost, you know, everything Mm -hmm. like having a nice car, having a nice apartment, like having certain clothes. And because I worked in the music industry, I was heavily influenced by wearing designer labels and all that sort of stuff. But when I kind of lost it all and I didn't uh, like an English term we have is I didn't have a pot to piss in, meaning I had nothing. I really had to humble myself and I realized, you know, materialistic things. I can't take this to the grave with me. I can't take this to the next life. It just gets left here. Um, And, you know, with the likes of social media, where unfortunately it causes a lot of anxiety within young people because they think they need to have a status symbol. They need to uh, accumulate a certain amount of things like Mm -hmm. over time to be somebody. Right. I'm a very I've lived a very humble life. I don't have a flashy car. I use public transport. Uh, I hardly buy new clothes. I can wear the same like hoodie for like five or six years and it'll still look brand new because I know how to look after it. Yeah. Uh, and my apartment, when my friends come around, they're like, Neil, this place is very minimalistic. And I'm like, because that's what I want my mind to be. You know, I wouldn't say that I live a Buddha, Buddhist lifestyle, but I realized like none of that shit really matters. Uh, for me, what's really important is, you know, the experiences that you have with people, the impact that you have. Uh, yeah. To my point earlier of, you know, uh, there are rooms where your name is spoken that you haven't even walked in yet, like mm-hmm. creating impact across the world. The time that I have with my son, with my family, my friends, you know, the new experiences of going to a new country. Um, again, money is needed in order to do certain things, but it's not the be all and end all uh, to show my wealth. Like my health is my wealth, right? The longer I can live, the more longevity I have. Uh, the more I'm able to do that for me is the shit that I want to collect. So, you know, by eating a healthy, going to the gym, getting the right amount of sleep, um, having somebody to talk to when times are really hard, um, expressing myself on a podcast, you know, this, this is the sort of shit that I like doing. Uh, and to your point, like having like a, a daily planner and a checklist, um, through lockdown, I learned this little thing where I've got my whiteboard and I always like mark what I'm going to be doing for the day. But what I found, Bram, was sometimes shit wasn't getting done. And I came to the end of the day to ask myself, why isn't it not getting done? And because I realized I didn't enjoy it. I was putting things into my calendar of stuff I really didn't want to do. And sometimes, yeah, you have to do things that you don't want to do, but you have to be able to motivate yourself in order to do it. So what I started doing on my whiteboard is writing the task, but putting a little emoji next to the task. So if it was to do with health, like going to the gym, I put a heart next to it. If it was writing in my diary, it was a happy face because it's to do with mindfulness. If it was to deliver SDR training, then I put a dollar sign or a euro sign next to it to signify money. 
Um, and like I would have like lunch again, it would be to do with my heart and my happy face. So that when I mark these things off on the calendar, it made me feel a sense of accomplishment that, yeah, do you know what? I've got something through the day. And that's literally how I stopped myself from going insane in lockdown because, you, you know, tasks became repetitive, but I had something to motivate me to feel accomplished on that. So Reason why? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a big thing. That's a, that's a good point of mentioning that. I'm going to try to apply that as well. Now, um, I think we can talk for hours about this. <laughs> maybe we should, we should do a second episode on this. But um, maybe a, a kick-out question, um, and I ask it to everyone. If I could give you a billboard, and it could say anything, what would you put on it? Hmm, that's a really good question. There's so many things that would come to mind, which is, you know, believe in yourself, right? You're the only person that's going to save you. Nobody else can save you but yourself. And no matter what goes through your life, know that you can accomplish so much just by what you put into your mindset and the people that you surround yourself with. Like you are the, the sum total of the, the six or five people that you surround yourself with. So if you have lazy people around you, you will be lazy. If you have successful motivational people around you, you'll be motivated and you'll be successful. And the only person that can make that happen is you. So 100% just believe in yourself. Does that answer your question, Bram? Yeah, it does. I think it's a very nice way of ending this episode with a, a believe in yourself mindset. I, I hope uh, that the people listening to this and watching this um, really feel load it uh to take on the world and to do what it takes <laughs> and thank you so much for having me on this show as well bram i really love what you're doing with the sound of sales top supporter here and uh it's just been a pleasure chatting to you and yeah just being able to speak not so much specifically just about sales but like you said the people behind sales i love this concept thank you so much thank you thank you for your nice words as well thanks neil thank you